sermon this morning, a little play on words, no challenge, no change. When we know challenges, we know change. I'm going to be teaching and preaching this morning from Acts, and before I start, I would like to make recognition to Memorial Day. I'd like to read something to you. How it all began. <clears throat> in, April, in April 1863, the story is told of an elderly woman leaving in Columbus, Mississippi, who was decorating the graves of her two sons that had died during the Civil War. This loving mother then strolled over <clears throat> to the corner of the cemetery to place her memorial flowers there also. Hey, what are you doing? Her friends shouted. Those are the graves of two Union soldiers. <clears throat> Excuse me. With compassion and a soft answer, the mother said, I know. I also know that somewhere in the north, a mother of a young wife mourns for them as we mourn for ours. So why is this story so significant? Because that loving deed set in motion our celebration today, which we call Memorial Day. Once a year, we honor the war dead. But their sacrifice is recognized every day because of their freedoms that we enjoy today. It is because of their sacrifice we are free to gather ourselves together in this place and worship our God. It has been estimated that since the Revolutionary War ended, over 600 American troops have died. Over 600,000 American troops have died in battle. While more than 500 had died from their combat-related causes here in the home front. These men and women who served our nation faithfully and courageously to fight on the great battlefields for our freedom will be forever remembered. There were great soldiers who gave all, no matter the cost. For Christians, there is someone else who sacrificed, including to give his life for free. Jesus left the glories of heaven to come to a foreign land to redeem man from his sins. He was a perfect sacrifice to set us free. In Genesis 3, 6, we read that Adam and Eve failed the test and broke the covenant and sinned against Christ, sinned against God. And it tells them in verse 19, By the sweat of his brow, they will have to earn their bread, struggle to provide for their families. Then when their life is over, they will be buried in the ground from which they came and returned to dust. Because of their sin, the whole world became sinful and all have come short of his glory of God. In Romans 3.23, it reads, We have all fallen into sin, which makes us guilty and deserving of death. In Romans 6.23, but is there hope? Glory be to God that there's a plan to save each and every one of us. In fact, there are two parts of salvation, his part and our part. John 3, verse 16 and 17 says, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son 
to come here and die. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but be given eternal life. His son did not come into the world to condemn them, but he came into the world to save us and forgive us. Romans 5.8 reads, Tell us, tells us that God showed his love for us while we were still sinners, that he gave his son to die for us. So we see that God is the ultimate warrior, the ultimate soldier who gave his life freely for us, for all humanity. So what a, what a beautiful day we celebrate and we don't forget the fallen soldiers. We don't forget those who have given their life freely. So important. And we don't take it lightly. I think some of us will know friends or neighbors or some have uh, uncles or aunts and uncles or fathers or some we know that who served in the military. And at this time, I, I, don't, I like to take opportunities. Those who served in our armed forces, would you, past or present, would you please stand this morning? I'd like to recognize that. And um, just stay standing, stay standing for a minute. We're, we're so blessed and so honored that we have so many, if you look around, we have so many who have taken that challenge and given their lives and given time in their lives, a period in their lives to serve our country. So thank you for that. God bless you. And um, have a seat. Thank you. So this morning, <clears throat> as we are going to go into our lesson. So we see no challenges, no change. But if we know challenges, we'll know change in our life. So we know that we all go through different challenges and different changes. Uh, we're going to be talking about a very familiar story in Acts 16, verse 16 through 40. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little foundation. Um, this is uh, the Apostle Paul. He's traveling with one of his servants and companions, Silas. And we've talked about this a little bit when I was preaching uh, <clears throat> my sermon about the, the armor of God. And we see Paul and Silas as they're coming. They're in Rome, and, and as they come in, there's a, a young girl who is following there, and she's demon-possessed. And they're, she's following them around. So I'm going to start reading from there and uh, bring this story to life. Verse 16, once <clears throat> when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. <clears throat> she learned a great deal of money. She made a great deal of money for, for her owners by fortune telling. I love this next verse here. Um, it, it talks about uh, that she knew, and remember, she's demon possessed, so it says she followed Paul. <clears throat> and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. So isn't it interesting, just by in verse 17, Satan can know and recognize people of God. So here she, Paul and Silas, look, knew, looked like anyone else, but Satan himself could recognize men and women of God. And she's, she's telling him, and she's, she's seeing things from the dark side, and she's saying, hey, these men are servants of God, and they're telling you the way to be saved. So even Satan can recognize those who are serving God. Verse 18, she kept this up for many days, and finally Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and he said to the spirit, and, and listen to how this, this sentence says, he doesn't say he's addressing the girl, but he says that he's addressing the spirit in the girl. <clears throat> and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. And I'm sure it was very, very different because when Paul came and he recognized and he was annoyed and he finally was through with her and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. And he says, I'm done. And, and it reminded me when I, I was reading this and studying for this that there's a lot of us in our life who are tormented. There's a lot of us who go through challenges in our life. 
that one time we just have to say, you know what? In the name of Jesus Christ, I'm done with this. Satan, I'm done with this. I'm done with a depression. I'm done with this anger. I'm done with this torment. I'm done with this. I'm done with this. And, and you stand your ground. And this is what Paul did. And he turned around. Remember what he said? I recognize the spirit in that girl. I recognize who it is. And he says, because I recognize it, I'm done with it. I'm finished. And there's so many times I, I can talk about my life alone in, in our marriage, things that we've we struggled with, that we had to both recognize it <clears throat> and say, you know what? I'm, I'm done with this in my marriage. I'm done with this, this bickering or this fighting or this thing that's grabbing a hold of us. I'm done with this spirit that's taken up and set up camp in my life. I'm done with this. So, so Paul says, I'm done with it. I'm, I'm just sick of it. And, and there's times in our life we need to be sick of it. And there's times in our life we need to be done with it. But remember, I want to go back to verse 16. We need to recognize what he did. Paul recognized, you know, there's a spirit in this girl. And, and a lot of times we're living life and we don't even recognize it. Becomes, it becomes part of our lives. It becomes part of our lives. We don't recognize it. It's like this, this spirit has set up camp set up camp and it becomes part of our life and we don't say I'm done with it no we just we go on come on spirits let's go and I'm just going to keep doing business and pretty soon we start seeing God one day we recognize it because we wake up or through prayer or through fasting or because we're sick of it we say I'm done with it and there's times <clears throat> I'll confess to you it was a long time I had a, a very, very severe anger problem. You know, I could yell and, and the, the windows in the house would shake. And uh, very angry. And um, <clears throat> I could be so angry. Ron and I would be, no, I never did a hands-on, so not that kind of guy. But I would yell and I'd be angry. And, and um, <clears throat> you can say things, you can do things. And then I would tell Rhonda, ah, oh, I shouldn't have yelled, or I'm, I'm sorry I got that angry. And she was already praying for me. She was already praying for me, and she would say, and I would say, can you ever forgive me? And she said this thing that, that really convicted me. She would say, I already have. And I'm thinking, and, and I'm, she's saying it. I walk away because I was weeping because I seen the presence of God using her, and she would say, I already have. And, and I'm weeping. I'm thinking, man, I'm a jerk. Man, this is terrible. And, and I had this anger for a long time. And it would happen again and again and again. And, and it was for years of this battle going through. And she would say the same thing. I'd say, man, I'm sorry. I should have never said that. I shouldn't have yelled. What's going on? And she's saying, I'm saying, can you ever forgive me? And she would say, I already have. And it was the gentleness of God working through her that convicted me. It was the gentleness of the Holy Spirit that delivered me. I mean, it's been 15 years since I've had this fit of rage and God delivered me, but I had to get sick of it. He uses someone that, that I, I love to help me be delivered from it. But see, this is what's going on in the sermon. Sometimes we read scripture, but we don't understand what, what it's saying. He's saying, you know what? Paul recognized the spirit. And sometimes that spirit is in our life, and we don't recognize a spirit that's walking and that's taking camp in our life. And, and what do we do? We tolerate it. We take it with us. Come on, spirit, let's go. Me and the spirit of anger, even, remember we talked about picking up a spirit of what? Anybody remember? We'll say it again. Offense. offense. We pick up a spirit of offense because, oh, I can't, I can't believe she said it. Oh, I can't even sit down with her. She drives me nuts. And, and we, it could be a guy. It could be a girl. We start saying that. We pick up a spirit of offense. We pick up a spirit. Comes in and says, hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accompany you. And, and you know what? I'm going to put this spirit of offense in you. And you won't even be able to stand or sit across from her. You won't even be able to be with her. You're going to hate it. And the spirit comes in and pretty soon you're like, ah. Wait a minute. See, when we're being fed by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, different kind of spirit, but the Holy Spirit of God, we can recognize the spirit that's in us or in someone else. We can say, you know what? I got to be a little bit like Paul and say, hey, get out. In the name of Jesus Christ, get out of my house. Get out of my marriage. 
Get out of my heart. Get out of my head. But we, we get so accustomed into just going to church and being churchy. We come in and it's like, ah, business as usual. And I'm going to bring my spirit. And I'm going to bring it with me. And this is what he's saying. Get out. Get out. I recognize you. Get out. Go on with the story. Verse 19. We see they become, they become getting, they're, they're getting angry. They're getting very angry, verse 19, because they hurt their money bank. The Roman citizens who, who had this young girl, this lung sir, who was demon-possessed, and they cast the demon out, and it says, when her owner re- realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities because their bank was gone. And it became personal, it became money personal. They were angry. Verse 20, they brought them before the magistrates and they said, these are the, the Jews that are throwing, are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful to us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. So remember... If we see what's happening here, as the story gets unwrapped, they did anything, nothing to break the law. They didn't put hands on, but they called this demon-possessed girl, and they called this demonic spirit out, and, and their owners are mad because the money bank, and they were, she's, sort, uh, she's uh, telling their future, and she's a fortune teller, and Satan is giving her this, this gift, this wicked gift, and they cast this demon out, and they're angry. So they take Paul and Silas, and they put them in prison. And this is, this is just my, my favorite part. I, I use this scripture a lot. Number verse 24, when he received their orders, he put them in, in the inner cell, and he fastened their feet in stocks. So, I mean, they must think Paul and Silas are some pretty wicked men, because not only are they in the center of the prison, they also put their, their feet in stocks. So if you can remember, they're in prison. They lock their feet down. I mean, they chain them up. They're going nowhere. <clears throat> Verse 25, and about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. They're praying. Their feet are in stocks. They're in the center of their prison, and they're praying. They're singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, now let me bring this to life, Okay. The other prisoners were listening to them. Why? Because their, their, their feet are in stocks. They just got the tar beat out of them. And they're in the inner, sit, inner courts of the, of the prison. And they're singing praises. They're like, they're singing praises. And remember the name of the sermon? Can you go right to the first title page again, please? And we see no challenges. So if you have no challenges, you don't know God. But Know the challenges, you're going to start trusting God. These men were challenged. They believed what they, were, what they were hearing. They believed who they were following. They were sold out. So maybe you're wondering on Memorial Day, why am I preaching this? Because I'm preaching dying to self. These men were dying to self. And, and I, I use a perfect example of God delivered me from an anger problem saying, you know what, I needed to die to myself. I needed to die to myself. And God was using somebody in my life to show me his peace, his calm, his deliverance, her prayer. And But you got to recognize, what, what spirit is in me? Is it the spirit of the living God? Or is it the spirit of Satan? Is it is his cohorts, his demonic residence inside of you? What's happening? What spirit is living in me? Do I have this spirit of offense? Have I been hurt? Am I angry? And he turns around, and in the middle of the storm, they're singing praises. I mean, it's insane. So if your faith isn't challenging you, it's not changing you. Their faith was challenging them, and it was changing them. So in our walk with Christ, if our faith isn't challenging us, it won't change us. And and each and every one of us in this room, you know what we'll deal with? Other than our own death and dying, 
we've seen death and dying. We've seen and witnessed death and dying. And, and I've seen people become very angry, very angry, and, and very bitter from it. But when we, when we see it and say, you know what, Lord, we don't ask to be born, we don't ask to die. But you know, here's the gift with God, is he promised us forever after. He promises us an eternity. He promises us that this isn't the end of the story. And then we find peace in that. We find peace in that. And we say, Lord, being a Christian, Lord, you promise us forever after. You promised us that this isn't the end of the story, that there's, there's a forever after. And so many times we focus on just right here and now. But you know what? There's more to this story. There's a forever after. And that's what we're promised. That's what he guarantees us, that death will not hold us, the grave cannot contain us. I want to read this to you. When we're not where, bless you, when we're not where we want to be and choose to worship, that's when people notice, that's when God sees our true colors. Are you worshiping or whining? And, you know, I... I Grew up two, two beautiful girls and my son, and uh, so three kids, and then I married this beautiful woman, and then I had three daughters and three teenagers, and then I was whining. So, uh, so here's the thing, when you, when you see that, and I would tell my daughters, I'd tell my son, hey, no, no whining, no whining. I said, use your words, you know, use your words, tell me what you got, but whining, I, I just can't stand it. So we don't say, hey, when life gets rough, I'm just going to start whining. You know, I'm going to start whining. And I used to tell my girls, I said, quit whining. You sound like a bunch of girls. Well, we are girls, Dad. Oh, yeah. And, and I said, quit whining anyway. You're driving me nuts. Quit whining. Stop it. And, and I used to tell them, use your words. What are you whining about? Talk to me. And, you know, God says the same thing. You know, what are you whining about? Just talk to me. Talk to me. You have a relationship. Talk to me. What are you whining about? And we need to have that relationship with God. We need to know we can talk to him. But when we just sit there and we bellyache and we whine and God says, you know, you're just whining. And we don't whine our things our way out of things. And I'm going to bring up David. So David, we know David died of cancer. He came over every Thursday. We talked. We prayed together. <clears throat> and I really grew a strong relationship because he came over every Thursday. He was there two, three hours. And Here's something he had said. He goes, he'd come in, and, and he would start talking. When he was starting getting depressed, he says, I'm sorry, I'm whining. I said, well, Dave, you're, you're dying. You have a reason to whine. He goes, I don't want to whine. You're supposed to, you're supposed to help me be tough. And I said, okay. I said, you want me to slap you? He goes, no, I'm not that tough. And, and I said, okay. He goes, just help me out. I said, well, and, and you know what we did? He wanted to go to the word that brought him comfort during his death, Right? He knew he was dying, so he says, I need to get into this word because this word sets me free. This word brings me victory. This word comforts me when? During his walk to the cross, to his grave, to dying. He wanted the word to strengthen him. So we would sit there and we'd look up scriptures and we'd go through the word and he goes, okay, I feel good. I'm right where I need to be. Thank you. But really, I, I was the one who was being blessed by him because I was watching a man who gave, was given his death sentence. He knew where he was going, and he was brave because he knew the God that he served. But sometimes we need someone to talk to. Sometimes we need someone to come alongside of us. That's why we have a Christian family. That's why we have brethren to strengthen each other, not to, to kick somebody when they're down, not to, to gossip, not to hurt, but to build up, to encourage, right? Amen. To build up and to encourage. When I was showing my behavior and my anger, I was blessed to have a woman of God to say, you know what? Hey, you know, I'm praying for you. I've already forgiven you. And I'm thinking, I'm a jerk. I said all these terrible things. I'm screaming and yelling. And she's showing me the peace of God and God is, is convicting me. The Holy Spirit's convicting me. And I was set free. 15 years ago, set free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and that's the power of God. So Paul and Silas are in there. I'm going to make this 
come home here real quick. Paul and Silas are in prison, and people are watching. You get it? People are watching you. People are watching you, especially when you represent Jesus Christ. They're watching you. And we could do a lot of damage. We could do a lot of damage. We can hurt a lot of people, not only by what we say, but our mannerism. Our mannerism. I'll tell you a true story. <clears throat> so I'm, a, I'm, I'm working for the Church of God. I'm a district manager. And I get a call. And this guy says, hey, I, I need you to come over here. We have not only is he an elder, he's on our worship team, and, and it's, it's pretty bad. And I'm like, well, what's bad? And he says, well, I'm going to tell you what happened. So I went. They had a video. I could watch it. The video recorded their service, and he was angry, and he's up there playing the piano. And here comes a young minister and his wife. They came in late. They were part of a prison ministry. It was like the fourth song. He come, they come walking in. And this guy's playing the piano, and he's angry. He's angry. And now he's looking at them, and he's playing the piano. But he's, he's singing praises to God. But the eyes are glaring, and he's just, ah. And people are noticing. People are seeing. But most of all, the young minister and his wife felt it, seen it. And, and they came to me, and they said, you know, we don't think we should be ministers. And I said, oh, why is that? Did you hear what happened? Did you see what happened? And I had to sit down. They were wounded. They were beaten up. And, and then, this, then the, the people in the congregation, well, you're the district manager. We need to talk to you. You know, we got a worship leader up there who's beaming out spears and snakes and fiery darts, and, and he's worshiping God. How does he do that? How does he sing praises to God? And pew, he's shooting these people down in the spirit. And they recognize the spirit that was in him. They recognize the spirit. How? He didn't say anything. He didn't say one word. They recognize his spirit by his mannerism. So what is it? Not for Christians. Not only do we need to, to say the right things, we need to act right, but you need to be right. This can't be just pretended. It needs to be right. Because remember, we're ambassadors of the Most High God. The scripture says, you represent me. God says, you're my ambassadors. So, so act right, be right, get it right. And guess what? When you're in the prison and you have shackles around your feet, praise me. Amen. That's what they did. That's what this story is about. They're in prison. They're shackled. Boop, their hands go up. And they're singing worship songs. I'm thinking, man, these guys are on drugs because that's crazy. <laughs> There's no way, you know. Have you ever got beaten up a little bit spiritually? Have you ever gone through the ringer spiritually? I don't want to raise my hands and start praising God. I'm like, oh, I'm whining, and then i got to stop the whining because it's wrong. I need to stop the whining because it's wrong. And God says, come on, don't be a girl, my line. Come on, grow up, my line. And I don't want to pick on women because I know some pretty tough spiritual women who've gone through hell and their hands go way up. And I say, how do they do that? How do they do that? So the story is, their feet are locked up. They're in the center of it, and, and the Holy Spirit comes. And this is, this is such a cool part. Verse 18. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Verse 24, after they were severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. The jailer who commanded to guard them for carefully. So we have a man. We have the head jailer. And he's, he's responsible. You know, these two very, very dangerous criminals. And their feet are in lockades. or in the middle of the cell. He says, hey, buddy, Mr. Jailer, do not let these vicious men go. You're in charge. And about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Verse 26 Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken and at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be that jailer that day. How do you explain that? No, honest. Honest, Caesar Augustus. Honest, it, I didn't do anything. They just, the, the doors came open and their chains came off and I, I didn't have nothing to do. I was watching them, but boom, I, I don't know how to explain it. 
And it says, the jailer woke up. Ah, he was sleeping. The jailer woke up. And when he saw the prisoners, he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword out. And he's about to kill himself. Why? Because he knew. This guy knew that he was going to be tortured. He knew that his head was going to be cut off. He knew that he was going to face a death. And he says, what? He knew he was about ready to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul, he shouts out to them, don't harm yourself. We're all here. We're all here. The jailer called for lights. Turn on these lights. What do you mean they're all here? He rushed in. He fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Here's why. That jailer seen the power of God. But you know what? People will see the power of God in you and through you. So when I'm having a fit of rage and I'm apologizing, I see the power of God in my wife. When my brother died, and I've said this to you a lot, I've seen the power of God in my mom praising God over her dead son because she knew where he was going. She's saying, ah, he's, he's, he's home now. He's, he's gone now. The butterfly's left now. He's okay now. I'm watching the power of God through her, and I'm witnessing it. And you know what? I'm going backwards here. I recognize a spirit that was in me because the spirit that was in her revealed it. Because I seen the spirit of God and I had the spirit of anger. And the spirit of God was saying, hey, you're looking pretty silly, all angry and all fed up. And she has this peace. And I'm seeing the spirit of God convicting me with no words other than I already have. I'm like, wow, are you serious right now? Are you serious right now? I'm in the fit of rage, and I already have. Because that power, Paul and Silas, the guard said, I seen the power of God. The doors are wide open. Their chains are off. And the guard is saying, I gotta. he pulls out his sword, and he's going to throw himself on it because he says, I'm a dead man. But Paul says, stop, stop. Don't kill yourself. It's okay, we're here. What do you mean you're here? What do you mean you're all still here? You need to be out. He says, no, we're here. And he says, not only are we here, so here it is. People are watching you, how I talk, how I behave, my emotions, my actions, my words. are watching. Right here, beautiful story. They're watching and, and, and if you're acting like a knucklehead, male or female, this person, so I'm visiting him, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, another church, watching the video and watching his anger, and people are coming up to me, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to let him go up? And it got worse because he belonged to, he was one of the elders, it got worse. And I'm like, are you kidding me? It got worse. The question was, how do you go through life with this spirit in you still worshiping God and still praising? And I'm thinking, man, this dude's an imposter. And I was able to sit down, but it all got revealed because the word of God will reveal it. The spirit of God will reveal it. And again, I'm standing up before you telling my anger was revealed. The spirit that was in me was revealed and I had to surrender to God because I was in prison. And to have that spirit surrender and say, you know what, I don't want to carry that around. Now, here's what's beautiful. I've had <clears throat> young men come to me because I used to help groom men who were going into ministry saying, you know what? Now, this is a true story saying, hey, I, I viewed pornography since I was 10 years old. He's 32 years old. He wants to be a minister. He's saying, you know what? I've been convicted. I, I need to get rid of this spirit. I need help. I, 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 need, I need to tell someone about this. I need help. And you know what? I just honored this man because he was saying, I got this spirit in me for ever since I was 10 years old. I'm 32. That's 22 years. He's saying, I need help. 
I, I need the Spirit has a hold of me. I need help. I need someone to talk to. I need help. And you know what? We got him help. That guy a, has a church of three, 400 people now. He he's, has accountability partners. He has his anywhere, whatever he does on his computer is monitored by his wife. It's a beautiful thing. He got help. He recognized a spirit that took up residence, what, in what? In a house of God. Your body is the house of God. The Holy Spirit lives in here. And the Bible says a house divided cannot stand. It cannot stand. You can't have the spirit of the living God and the spirit of the living Satan in you. It says it won't stand. There's a turmoil in there. Never, there's, you'll never be content. So if we're sitting today in the hearing and you're not content, you need to say, you know what? It's starting to make sense. I got a couple spirits in here, maybe four or five. And, and I'm living this torment. And, I, and we had to talk to this man, and we had to, we had to talk to this elder. And we had to say, hey, you know, oh, I, I didn't act like that. No, here's the video. Here's what happened. Here's what took place. The damage that it caused, no word said, the scour, the anger, affected so many people in the congregation, affected this, this young man and this soon-to-be minister and his wife to say, you know what, um, maybe we need to take a time out because if we're so wounded by just this scour, I don't think we're ready to be ministers. They took a year off. They took time off to see if this was really what they wanted to do. So, you know, when you look at the moral of this beautiful story, it's people are watching what we say, what we do. But you know what, it's not always what we say. They're watching our actions. They're watching our actions. They're watching our emotions. They're watching how I walk, what I do, should reveal who I serve. And again, I, I'm not standing up here condemning. I'm telling you, I gave you my, my confession. 15 years ago, I was delivered from the spirit of anger. Anger. And being able to be delivered from it and not being tormented by it. Huge. And what we do, what we say, and I, I just love that part where they said, you know what? They're singing. What? They got beaten. They're chained up. They're in the middle of the, the prison. They're singing. What do you mean they're singing? Yeah, they're singing. And all the prisoners noticed. See what he's saying? Hey, you know what? You're serving God. People will notice who you're serving. They will notice who you serve, by what you say, and your mannerism, and how you act. So the jailer, <clears throat> he, notice, he notices them because they're singing. And he comes to them, and he's seen, they've seen the power of God. The jailer seen the power of God. The jailer called for the lights. He rushed in, trembling, and he falls to Paul and Silas' feet. <clears throat> He then brought them out and asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Our lives. He said, what, what do I have to do? He's seen God in that place. He's seen God in his action. He's seen God in their actions and what he's do. Verse 33. And, and he turns around and he says to them, What do I need to do to have some of that? What do I need to do to get myself some of that? What, what is that? that? That peace that you got in the middle of a storm, where do I get some of that, Paul and Silas? Where do I get, get myself some of that? You know, you're in the middle of a storm, you're praising God, you're singing, and he says, where do I get myself some of that? And I'm thinking, wow, that's just, that's incredible. So as Christians, people, God should... People should look at you and see how you live your life and what we're doing. And in the middle of a storm, praising God and saying, hey, you know what? Where do I get myself some of that? What, what, some of that, some of that peace that you have. Some of that peace in the middle of a storm, where do I get myself some of that? And that calm you have in the middle of a storm, where do I get myself some of that? That's what this, this guard is saying. You guys are singing in the middle of the storm. And he's saying, where do I get myself some of that. Because you know what? 
He said, that's, that's powerful. At that hour, at that night, the jailer took them. He washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and his household were baptized. So you know what this jailer does? He takes them out of the jail. He takes them to their, his house. And to meet his wife and kids, he washes their wounds. So it tells you they were beaten pretty bad. And the jailer says, and he washes their wounds, and immediately he and his household were baptized. They seen the power of God and what God did in the jail cells. He's seen the power of God in these two men. In these two men, he's seen the power. And they said, I want some of that. The jailer brought them into the house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household were saved. That's a beautiful story. So let's, let's, let's bring that to life here. Let's bring it to life. And let's, we're going to close. So people should be able to see your life. People should be able to see your life. And people should be able to say, you know what? Man, there's something different about your family. There's some peace that you have. And, and I see you. I watch you. And th there's something you have. <clears throat> and I want some of that. So he took them in. So I believe this. When a church is growing, when a church is, is growing, we're getting to know each other, we need to know each other. So what does he do? He, he feeds these two men. He takes care of their wounds. Sometimes people's wounds aren't physical. Sometimes they're deeper and you can't see them. Sir, what's your name? Dave. Say it again. Dave. Dave, thank you for being here. It's your second time here. Yes, sir. Right? Thank you for being here. So what happens? Visitors come. We want to meet Dave, right? Dave, I seen you playing for Dave last week, right? Yep. I seen you playing for Dave. He should feel welcome, right? And it started with Nick inviting him to church. Thank you, Nick. That's, that's huge. An invite. An invite. Just inviting him because it's saying, hey, I just want you to come in. That's powerful. But you know what happened is inviting Dave to church is like saying, hey, you know what? I want to introduce you to my God. I want to introduce you to his eternity. That's a pretty big deal. That's a big deal. You think it's a big deal? Absolutely. 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 That's your job. That's my job. We are supposed to invite people into the glory of God, and we're supposed to say, hey, I want to invite you in. Why? It's your job. It's called the Great Commission. It's in the Bible. Read it sometime. It's a real good book. But he tells us it's our job to tell people and invite them in. And here's what should happen. Dave should be able to come in here and say, man, these are some friendly people. They come up and they say, hi. Darren doesn't only sing, but he'll say hi to me. And, and we smile and we have the spirit of God on us. See, this is what he's saying. The jailer's seen what God did, but he's seen God in these two men. So does God, do people see God in me? Do people see the Holy Spirit in me? Remember, remember this story. Remember this story. Even the satanic spirit seen the presence of God. And even the men with the Holy Spirit seen the presence of Satan. So if you think you're being an imposter, it won't last long. And this man that I told you about, it was neat to see him we didn't throw them out. We seen God recycle. God's in the recycling business. And we see him repent and, and starting to get what was happening in his life. And this anger went from way back. And, and watching God heal him and deliver him and watching the church still love this person right where he was at. Beautiful story. Know him, know him personally. Beautiful story. Watching because God is in the recycling business. I've been recycled. Anybody been recycled? I've been recycled. Hey, hold your hands up. Stand up with me. Have you ever been recycled? I've, I've been recycled. And while you're there, we're going to worship and sing to God, right? I've been recycled. So you know what? We sing praise and worship because, hey, I've been recycled. I've been recycled right here. I've been recycled. And I serve a God who's in the recycling business. Praise God for that. Let's worship God together.